I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com, and here today with me is Tabby Costa, Partner and Portfolio Manager at Prescott Capital. Thank you so much for being here. Great to have you. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this conversation. I hope it's going to be a good one. We're we're catching up from back in November is the last time we spoke, so definitely a lot has happened since then. And at the time, you had told us, looking at gold, that a price rise was inevitable. And I think certainly now we see that playing out in 2024 with the price having gone to record highs. So that's where I wanted to begin and just ask you if gold's price increase has played out in the way that you expected. I think it's actually been more than I expected personally. I'm kind of uh, surprised of how much of an appreciation we've seen and how much uh, of a movement we've had so far and how we had this level of change without really causing positioning from investors to be extreme. So you know, if you look at the future markets or GLD, which is the most popular ETF for gold, you're not really seeing the tick up of assets or in other words, uh, that the Western societies are really overwhelmingly bullish in the metal. In fact, you know, if you read the newspapers, we barely see people talking about gold still. So the sentiment hasn't really changed and also position hasn't really changed, which makes me think that not only central banks are the, one accum the ones accumulating the metal, but also that this movement appears to be much more sustainable than most people think. Because you know, we usually when we have a big move up in any asset or inclination as a trader, not as an investor, is to be a, bit, a little bit uh, leery of of those of those movements and start actually fading some of those trends. Uh, but I, I think this is a real uh, price appreciation, and I really think this is the beginning of a secular bull market for the battle that is yet to drive other things. So we've had a, a period of consolidation here recently. Um, you know, we're consolidating at about 2300 or so. We're bouncing between 23, sometimes 2250. Uh, all the way up to 24, but ultimately I think we go much higher. And as we see that happening, uh, it will it should also drive uh, inflows towards the mining industry, which is to me the, the big opportunity here. Uh, outside of the metals that are linked to gold that should also benefit tremendously like silver and other precious metals and even base metals like copper that are starting to have a large movement as well. Okay, interesting. And so for you, this is still mainly a central bank led price increase when it comes to gold. We're still waiting for those other elements to really come into the market. Yes, and it's also um, very interesting from a standpoint of looking at the industry of of mining. As you can see, uh, we are starting to see some of M and A activity, which is usually a sign of uh, of the beginning of a bull market in the space. And that's that's key here because. Um, to me, it sounds like the majors are hungry and are hungry for newer assets. And so we're starting to see engagement of some of the investments we have in our own portfolio with the major companies, but also announcements of large either acquisitions or even uh, just a merger of, of different uh, businesses. And it's not only in the gold space, it's, it's also in the copper space and others. And so it, it is very, um, very um, I would say, opportunistic to be looking at those at this industry right now. And in line with all this, if you think about what's been happening over the last few decades, it's sort of fascinating. I mean, just looking at every single metal, because I, I think gold is a proxy for inflation. Let's just use that as a proxy for inflation. And if you look at copper in gold terms, or if you look at zinc prices in gold terms, if you look at oil in gold terms, any commodity is basically at a, at a highly depressed price you know, today. Uh, relative to uh, other periods in history. And to me, this just goes to show what we, we did see an inflation in, in financial assets, but not really that true consumer inflation that we tend to see like we're starting to see now. So to me, gold is is sort of the, the first thing to really move and sort of the first box to check uh, in terms of a, of a secular market. But where you're really going to likely get those big returns is going to be on things that tend to move with gold. And as we see gold move, uh, usually you tend to see other metals really leading the way to the upside, regardless if it is copper, silver, cobalt, zinc, and so forth. And and those are, you know, I think they're going to be um, uh, a great places to be deploying capital here in the near future. 
Okay. And going back to your comment on M&A, so you mentioned usually we see this at the beginning of a bull market. In general, of course, each deal is different, but what are your thoughts on the quality of the transactions that we've been seeing so far in gold, or, or you can go broader if you want to? Um, I would say, I'm not sure is so much uh, on the quality side, but perhaps more the focus has been clearly in, in copper and electrification metals is, is clearly what's, what's happening. Um, we're seeing this, especially coming from the gold companies, which is um, not shocking. I mean, gold companies are very popular, uh, have are very famous for changing their tune at the wrong time. And so, you know, it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing that. In fact, this is reflecting on the decline of production globally of gold that we're seeing here. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, back in the 70s, uh, we, we saw the same phenomenon happening. So globally, we're seeing production declines of, of gold, given this refocus of most of those miners uh, into uh, copper. And I think copper is going to be huge. I mean, if you look at copper prices today relative to gold, um, you know, we're talking prices that we didn't see all the way back to the 1990s. And so, you know, basically copper prices are the same as they were back in the 90s, which is crazy to think. Um, so there's definitely opportunities there. This AI revolution, along with uh, what we're seeing in terms of the uh, the demand for electrical vehicles and also the demand for even, um, you know, electric heating, uh, all those things. So those three buckets, AI, electric heating and electrical cars are likely to be driving the demand for electricity uh, to levels that we haven't seen probably since the Industrial Revolution. And then on top of that, you have what's happening with uh, um, the construction boom, not only, uh, especially coming from the manufacturing side, uh, which if we looked at the infrastructure bills that we've seen so far, they're insane. I mean, we're talking three times what we saw back in, you know, during, after the World War II, when we tried to rebuild economies. And so, um, the majors are going to have to be busy. They're going to have to be looking for those uh, jurisdictions that they can uh, they can be building mines. It is interesting the South American focus recently as well. Uh, South American uh, assets tend to be um, you know in 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 times a uh, very difficult place to invest. But in my opinion, that is changing uh, significantly. And and I've been a very big you know uh, uh, proponent of investing in South America. In fact, we've uh, made an acquisition of of uh, one of the largest silver and zinc mines in the world, uh, the San Cristobal mine in Bolivia. And I think there's going to be a lot of uh, partnerships being uh, made uh, with South American companies, given the fact that we are in desperate need for metals and South America will probably be the one uh, part of the world that will be serving most about the economies moving forward, whatever, if it is, you know, iron ore or steel or or gold or silver or copper and whatever you you name it uh will probably be uh coming from south america uh like we saw in others other cycles too and so um you know believe it or not the prioritization of most uh, uh assets have been mostly focused on jurisdiction but not really from a perspective of how soon can you build a mine and i think in south america given the understanding of how mining is a large percentage of their own economies, I think that they're going to be uh, much quicker to respond in terms of allowing projects to get into production much quicker. Yes, we have a few stores like the Panama store and some others that have been, you know, swimming the other direction, but that's normal. No, we're not going to see everything go in the right direction, but certainly things are moving to me, uh, in a very effective way. And I, I think we're going to see great opportunities there as well. Okay, really interesting. And I have a couple more questions to ask on gold, but I want to follow the copper path for a moment. So copper, we always hear it called Dr. Copper. It's a bellwether for the economy. And we've seen copper prices moving in the last couple of months or so. So what is copper telling us about the global economy right now? I think we're in the process of seeing Dr. Copper become Dr. Green Revolution and green revamping of manufacturing rather. But I agree that, you know, the 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 copper price tends to actually lead economic growth and so forth. And certainly what we're seeing recently uh, maybe reflects something else, maybe reflects uh, this shortage of electricity that we may see in the next few years, uh, which I think is going to be a huge theme. Uh, shortage of electricity, mostly driven by 
uh, all those three buckets I, I said, the electric vehicles and also the electric heating and also AI would be very significant. I mean, even from a standpoint of natural gas prices, which will probably play a role there as well. Now, looking at natural gas prices today, which have been sort of in a glut because of the lack of uh, finishing of some of the pipelines and infrastructure that would require to kind of close the gap of natural gas prices in the U.S. versus global prices, and also the LNG infrastructure that is still being in process of being built. Um, all those things, the convergence of the, the prices today in the U.S. versus global markets is 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 also uh, something that I think it's an opportunity. I mean, I, I don't understand how we're going to see all these pressure towards uh, demand for electricity, which by the way, if you look at electricity and demand in overall, you know, it, it tends to be very gradual increases it's, and very small, very predictable. What we're seeing today reminds me in a, in a different way, maybe, maybe from the research that we look at on the, on the, on the industrial revolution, but also it reminds me very much of the research I did once regarding, you know, the potential for, uh, all the fiscal stimulus that we had coming out of the pandemic, especially coming from uh, those stimulus checks that, you know, I remember seeing numbers of savings relative to income that have, we've never seen before and understanding that that was going to drive demand and I was going to drive inflation and markets were very, you know, very wrong footed at that time regarding the, the this uh, this potential for uh, for unleashing all the spending from consumers, given the fact that they receive money from the government. Um, and I think it's similar in that sense, what we're seeing with the electricity here and very likely to see shortages in the next one year or so. Uh, you know, there's some big voices that have been talking about this. And, uh, and so we, I think that copper is, to answer your question, I think copper is reflecting more than anything is reflecting those issues, and then maybe maybe growth is 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 also one part of it. But I think that it's definitely the fact that we're seeing this huge push towards uh, revamping electric grids in a time when uh, electric electricity demand is probably going to surge uh, to levels we haven't seen. And there's going to be disruptions in utility companies. There's going to be um, even potential problems with. Uh, with how we, you know, the crypto mining is adding to the electricity demand. There's all sorts of things really that could drive that. So one way to play that is also on the natural gas trade, which is, and we, I'm happy to discuss this here, but I think it's as asymmetric as it gets and one of, probably one of the best opportunities in the commodity space that I've seen in the last uh, few years. Yeah, I would love to hear more about the natural gas angle if, if you'd like to go into that. Well, I think that first, I, I made the point about AI uh, and how that's likely to drive the demand for electricity that will likely drive the demand for natural gas. I also uh, would like to say that this issue with the co potential convergence of natural gas prices is mostly a political issue, right? Uh, the current administration is not allowing those pipelines to be built, and therefore we're not seeing, um, you know, the the, the, the change in natural gas prices we should see causing the glut that we're seeing in the U.S. But uh, I do think that that's a, a short-term phenomenon. And uh, when you look at even in the convert on the contango there, it's formed in the futures curve of natural gas. Every time we've seen a contango as much as extreme as we're seeing now, uh, it will actually mark a bottom for for natural gas prices and very you know significant bottoms. Today, natural gas prices in nominal terms is retesting every seven major bottle we've had since the 90s or you know, mid 80s. And so I think, why is this time different? I don't think it is different. I think we're probably going to see a big change in prices caused by that. And the other thing you can think about, I'm a big bull in oil. I'm, I'm not here to say I'm not a big bull in oil. But if you look at oil to net gas spread, which you have to adjust for uh, what we call the BTU spread. So on a BTU basis, you got to put it in equivalent basis. And when you see that, it's today close to or above E or around E in that ratio. That is the highest level outside of April 2012 that we've seen in history. And April 2012 was a major bottom for natural gas. Oil prices went sideways and net gas basically went from two bucks to another close to six bucks. So, you know, would that surprise me if we see a move like that today? No, it wouldn't surprise me at all. 
So it reminds me of looking at the oil market back in April 2020, and people were saying, yeah, we'll probably bottom at some point in oil prices, but it will take some time for us to see that. And no, it didn't take any time. It happened very quickly, and we all wish we had our portfolios all loaded in oil at that time, and we didn't. And then one of the biggest signals that actually showed that was the equity performance of that industry, meaning when oil prices turned negative during that time, we actually saw energy companies going up, which was crazy. Oil companies, during that week oil prices turned negative, actually closed as one of the best, or I think the best sector of that week, which is insane. And so um, that to me was what marked the bottom. That gave me high conviction. I remember hearing a lot of people saying the number of companies that would go bankrupt because of all those issues and end up being very, very false uh, narrative. And so I think it's sort of similar today. And uh, the sentiment has really given up in that guess. And I think that right now is the time to be dipping your toes into it. Okay. And so how how would you be approaching that? Because I think investors in the resource sector, they're pretty familiar with mining companies and the different levels of companies that you can look at. They might be a little bit less familiar when it comes to natural gas as well as oil. Well, the interesting phenomenon happening is that if you look at the equity prices, they are not ultra cheap like natural gas itself. So there's a divergence between them. And, you know, some people try to blame or blame a justified this divergence saying that what's happening is that those companies are very well hedged. While I think that that's partially true, if you look at companies that are on the hedge, you're going to see that there is also a divergence. And some people say, well, that actually has to do with the margins. Their margins are really big. And you look at their margins, their margins have been bigger in the past. And it tends to follow natural gas prices. So what we're seeing today is basically equity prices telling you that natural gas prices are just unsustainable at these levels. And equity prices are leading the way to the upside. That's my interpretation of what this divergence is. And so when I look at that, um, you know, I get really excited about the space, but I think that the, the opportunity itself is in the commodity. So we've been buying September contracts and the natural gas. And also I think that that's not really the front front month. It's actually a little bit out like September or so that, that I think it's, it's more attractive. Um, and, uh, you can see that after the summer months, there is a big surge in the future prices, which is causing the contangle. Maybe that has to do with Trump getting reelected. I think that that's a possibility because Trump getting reelected and usually we tend to see those being more favorable uh, uh, political narratives towards em uh, energy companies. So we got to understand that while that might drive production of oil much higher, uh, it may also lead to the finishing of some of those pipeline constructions that have been you know, put aside uh, during the Biden administration to keep oil natural gas prices lower. Maybe you can call this a conspiracy or maybe that's just a strong opinion from my end. Uh, but I, I do think that, that that's maybe what it, the future markets is pricing in. And so if you look at September prices, if there is you know potential for natural disasters, all sorts of things could happen. You know, it's, those are all potential positive um, uh, you know, pressure on the price, not positive for society. I'm not saying natural gas prices are natural... Uh, disasters are good for society. I'm just saying that that's that's a risk that is not really um, it's completely really mispriced in the in the in the future uh, contracts going out uh, to September. And so I think that that's that's really the the opportunity. Okay, thank you for going into that. That was that was really interesting to hear about. And I think this is my pathway back back to gold because if we could talk about divergence between the commodity and the equities. Gold, certainly, I know people are looking at the gold stocks and they're wondering, okay, what is going on here? And I know that you are bullish there. And I want to ask you about when you think they may catch up, what you think is going on, because I see a lot of people in our audience thinking, okay, they're they're just getting tired of this. <laughs> That's a great sign, by the way. Um, I, I hope you'll let me know when they are start throwing the, the towel. But I think a lot of people are, which is... We're so close from a historical breakout in the miners. We were so close yesterday from a monthly breakout. And then we had a big dump in prices, the largest dump in the GDX uh, ETF that we've seen since 2020, by the way. So 
I think that the, the 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 mining industry is so close to one of those big move ups that we tend to see in the industry, three four hundred percent moves in the short term, and that's really driven by. You now I was speaking with somebody in a conference the other a uh, few months ago in Switzerland, and or maybe a month ago in Switzerland, and this person was um, a very contrarian investor, just to give an example, and uh, you know claiming that. And I was asking this uh, him. What was, you know, what would uh, what would change your view about the gold space? And, you know, he said, well, we need a catalyst. And I said, well, how in the world is not gold prices breaking out, not a catalyst? And it's just like people have lost faith in this industry overall. And this was very similar, not to early 2000s, but really to the 1970s. The 1970s, we had this level of um, sort of perception that the industry would never come back. And the industry, you know, unless I'm wrong and it's different this time, the industry always comes back. And so I'm a believer of that. This is one of the oldest industries we have in history. And the great thing about that is that we can look at data going back centuries from, from today. And I don't think we've experienced such a you know, level of undervalue um, of valuations across this space uh, like we're facing currently. And it, there's a lot of opportunities here for activist investors because those um, those inefficiencies that we're seeing from companies being run by the wrong people or assets that are not you know uh, receiving the, the right amount of love in terms of how to um, how to drill those those places or how to develop those assets and that's just quite normal of of an industry that has not received any capital whatsoever and and it's been neglected for so many uh, decades. And so uh, in the early 2000s, we had the miner to gold ratio actually not go up massively. It kind of went sideways during that cycle, uh, which means that the miners didn't really, um, you know, in the paper, didn't really outperform hugely the gold price itself. Although uh, it was a great time to be invested in the mining space. Now, I would strongly argue that this time we're going to see the mining industry massively outperform gold prices because usually uh, the conventional wisdom is wrong. And I've never seen an industry that is more hated than the gold space. I mean, even, even the cannabis industry recently got some love from the government, which in the front of the, the Wall Street Journal today, they... Uh, had good news and and the, the whole industry is is, is getting uh, some upside here recently. Um, I don't know of a single industry that is more hated than the gold miners. I'm not talking about silver, not uranium, not copper, gold miners. They are the most hated industry in the whole market. And I think that's a huge opportunity. I was sitting in a in a in a dinner not too long ago and this geologist posed a question What's the moral reason to buy and to mine gold? I mean, when a geologist who studied his whole life, I just said what, what gender he is, but uh, he studied his whole life, this whole space is asking questions like that. That means to me that that has to be somebody just completely throwing in the towel. I mean, people don't understand that this is the most useful metal in history. And therefore, it's so useful that it's used as a currency Then. People just don't understand the whole thesis behind hard assets. And then when I look at the correlation of assets, especially coming from 60-40 portfolios, and you see that how much those traditional allocations are so focused in buying technology and, and hedging that position with fixed income. And then I look at the correlation of those two instruments, and it's at all-time highs. What does that mean? That means you're taking massive risk in those two allocations because they're not hedging each other. They're basically moving the same direction. Higher interest rates, lower share prices. Um, lower interest rates, higher share prices. That's not the environment we lived in, in the last two to three decades. This is an environment we lived in inflationary eras. And so I really, really caution people uh, that continue to you know, really uh, uh, fight this, this, this recent trend that we're seeing because I think this recent trend will last many, uh, maybe maybe even a decade or so. By the way, this is not a new normal. This is what, what has been a new normal was the last two to three decades. Back prior to the, the 80s or so, um, 
we've always seen a very strong correlation between 10-year yields uh, or treasuries and, 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 and I should say the equity markets. It's just recently that that correlation flipped to negative, which allowed people to own a big chunk of equities and then hedge that position with fixed income. What if in 10 years from now, those traditional portfolios start taking three, four, five percent positions in hard assets? That's pretty, you know, conservative in my view, what I'm saying. Or what if the 60% allocation in equities that is majority technology just turns into, you know, 20%, 10% technology and a lot more in boring businesses like mining uh, and infrastructure developments and emerging markets and also, I think it's highly likely. So that rotation out of those very, you know, overweight, uh, asset classes into things that have been uh, long now undervalued uh, will probably take place in the next decade as it usually does. And so it makes me very bullish about the whole space and gold miners will probably play, play a very big role into this. Okay, very good. It's really helpful to hear your your strong convictions there. So I don't, I don't want to keep you too long, but I'll put it back to you before I let you go and just ask if you had any final thoughts you leave investors with. Um, look, my final thought is that I feel like investors most times try to, um, wait for prices to change until they change their opinion. And this is the weirdest thing we see in this industry is the fact that, you know, you go to grocery stores and things get cheaper. People make a line and start buying it in the markets. It's the opposite. It's like people wait for prices to go higher. So they start chasing that product. I mean, this is the most backward looking way of investing I've seen in my career, but that's happening. That happens throughout history and, uh, and maybe to a degree that we've never seen in the mining industry. So what I would say is, uh, you know, I, I view this as, you know, I don't think the case has changed for gold. In fact, I think it's only strengthened. If the strength, if the gold case is strong, that means the copper case is strong. That means the silver case is very strong. And that means the mining industry case is very strong. Now, if you look at the prices and the valuations we're paying for those companies and those businesses at ultra low levels, that I, I can't, I mean, I don't even know why we even talk about technology companies because the opportunity really is there. I mean, that's really where everybody should be spending 90% of their time. So that's where I spend 90% of my time. But I think maybe it will become obvious in five, 10 years from now and uh or or maybe not maybe i'm very wrong and and uh and um i'm you know but i i i have very high conviction in this thesis and uh i will stay you know i even if prices don't go much higher gold prices don't go much higher from the, for the next 5 to 10 years i would assume that there's even an activist case to be made in this industry because there's so many inefficiencies that you can improve assets drastically given how cheap they are to be purchased today so, boy, you know, it's time to get busy and not to be, uh, you know, concerned about why are miners not moving versus gold. That's my two cents. Okay. Okay. I think that's a very good spot to wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming on today to go over what's happening in gold and the resource market more broadly. This was great. Thanks for having me. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is Tabby Costa with Crescut Capital. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.